Good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Can you see up the back? Can everyone see okay? Okay, great, because if you couldn't, there's not much I can do about that. Sorry. All right, so uh, my name is Lindsay Homewood. I'm from Bulletproof Networks. Today I'm going to be talking about data-driven alerting with Flatjar, uh, which is an open source thing that we, uh, we contribute a lot to, and Puppet, uh, and combined with Hira as well. Um, so it's, uh, it's a, little bit, uh, a little bit different from maybe some of the other content that we've had today, uh, in that we are focusing more on the monitoring side of things, but we're looking at uh, configuring monitoring through Puppet and using Puppet to drive Flatjack. So, what is Flatjack? Um, very simply put, Flatjack is a monitoring alert routing system. That's it. So Flatjack is constantly uh, accepting a stream of events and working out who it needs to notify. So it's completely composable, it works well with other open source monitoring tools, it plays very well with the likes of Nagios, Sasinga, Sensu. Uh, it has rollout built in as well, so this is really useful if you're going to have tons of monitoring alerts that could potentially come to you at any point in time. So if you've got you know, a large fleet of servers, thousands of servers, uh, and let's say hypothetically you have uh, some sort of failure in some sort of underlying shared system, um, rather than sending out an alert for each individual thing that's failing, we can roll all those up and send out a single, uh, a single alert. Uh, and as I said, it does alert routing. Um, so people are very much at the center of what we're trying to do here with Flatjack. Uh, and the way that this basically works is that an event comes in, Flatjack is trying to determine whether it needs to notify somebody about that, uh, who is going to notify about that, and how it goes about notifying. That's it, that's all the Flatjack does. Very, very simple, um, but there is a lot of nuance and complexity to it. Uh, Flatjack is also completely API driven. Uh, so all the configuration data within it uh, is all uh, accessible via an API. Uh, and the nice benefit of this, compared to other monitoring tools, is that there are no restarts required for whenever you're making a monitoring configuration change. Um, who here has maintained like a large Nagios installation before? Like say, upwards of, I don't know, 500 posts or so. Okay, so a few people, and, and, and just a quick, quick shout out, how many people have you normally uh, been trying to notify if something in that infrastructure fails? Like 10, 20, 100 people? 20. 20, okay. And isn't it always a bit of a pain to have to restart an RGS every single time you're, uh, you're making one of those configuration, or sorry, adding a new person, a new person that's come to the team? It can be a bit of, be a, bit of a pain. So um, yeah, that's what we're trying to do here with Flapjack, eliminate that pain. Um, so we have developed it, uh, and we're using it in production at Bulletproof Networks. Um, so uh, by two people, actually, Ali and Jesse. Jesse's just down here. Let me just throw a hand. Here we go, there's Jesse. And I'm doing sort of a bit of project management on all of this. Um, so we've been using it. Uh, we've been developing it for the last 18 months. We've been using it in production for the last 12, a little bit over 12. Uh, and it's working really well for us. Uh, it's completely open source, and we're built upon... Um, Pretty similar foundations actually to what Puppet is built upon. Uh, it's written in Ruby uh, and it uses Redis uh, behind the scenes. And Redis is sort of like a, a data structure server. Uh, and it has a bunch of data structures in it um, that make it really, uh, you know, th they help us solve a lot of the problems that we're trying to solve in Flatjack very, very easily. Uh, but the core thing that we're trying to do here with Flatjack is we're trying to design a monitoring system for humans. Uh, you can sort of think of Flatjack as being the umbrella here um, and the rain as being the stream of alerts that are coming through. Um, we want to be able to protect the humans so that they're not, you know, at the end of a, of a hard day of work, they're not completely uh, soaked through. So, uh, why would you use Flatjack? Um, so, if you're using like a, a large Nagios, uh, you know, if, if you're operating a large Nagios cluster, um, you might be wondering, okay, well, I've sort of invested a whole bunch of time and effort into making this work. Uh, why would I use something else? Um, so, there are some very specific use cases that Flatjack helps you out with. Um, firstly, if you've got any sort of multi-tenancy concerns, so say you're a service provider or a hosting provider uh, and you have lots of different customers and lots of uh, people at each of those different customers that might want to be notified about particular things that fail, uh, Flatjack can help you out very, 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 very well with that. Um, 
Also, this works quite well if you've got a lot of segregated responsibilities. So say you're an enterprise uh, and you aren't sort of fully buying into the whole DevOps thing. Uh, and you've got different teams that are responsible for, uh, you know, that are, that are sort of siloed off of, for one another and they're, uh, they're responsible for these particular classes of alerts and these class alerts alone. Um, and Flatjack makes it very, very easy. You can leverage a lot of the, uh, a lot of the functionality that you get uh, for the multi-tenancy to do the sort of segregated responsibility for, for all of your monitoring alert routing. Uh, the other really cool thing here, though, is check engine independence. So uh, we use it in production in a bulletproof with Nagios. Um, however, uh, you can run it with multiple uh, check execution engines, so say a Nagios, a Singer, uh, Sensu, um, all upstream, all creating events and streaming them to Flatjack. Flatjack will aggregate all of those together um, and uh, it basically acts as like the central choke point for all the notifications that are going out. So if you've got lots of failures for lots of different systems uh, uh, that are being detected by lots of different monitoring systems, you can actually centralize all that configuration in one place, um, which is sort of pretty useful as well if you want to do like a prototype uh, implementation of a new particular monitoring system. You don't have to go about duplicating all your notification settings again. You can find it in one place and you can just plug and play. Uh, and there are some killer features that allow Flatjack to do all of this. So firstly, there's self-checking. Um, and this is actually a really important thing when, we, when we're sort of all, as an industry, sort of starting to move towards uh, composable monitoring, where you've got like a pipeline of different monitoring events that are coming through, uh, and you want to make sure that some sort of failure further up, uh, further up the chain uh, isn't causing some other failure further down the line. Uh, so with the self-checking thing, uh, in Flatjack we've got a thing called Ubitep, so you have event producers, so they're, they're the likes of like Nagi, also Singa, Sensu. Uh, and they're sending a stream of events to Flatjack. Uh, and then we've got the Ubitet that's sitting on the other end, which stands for the out-of-band end-to-end test. Um, it's looking for these events that are coming through, and it's working out whether it's, uh, whether it's seeing events as frequently as what it thinks it should. It's actually a little bit more nuanced than that. So we've actually got this Flapper service up here, which is a monitoring, uh, like a generic monitoring service that uh, is oscillating between being OK critical. Uh, and then we have your event producers. So let's just say, uh, hypothetically, we're talking about Nagios here. Uh, it's running a monitoring check against the flapper uh, to say, hey, you know, are you up or are you down? It's going to detect uh, at a regular interval that, it, that it's actually going up and down. Uh, and then it's streaming the events, just like any other sort of monitoring event to Flapjack. Flapjack is going, oh, okay, I actually need to notify somebody about that. Sending it to a Jabba room. Uh, and then we've got the Uber test sitting in the Jabber room going, oh, okay, I'm seeing that uh, this particular monitoring check that I'm, that I'm looking out for is actually going between an OK and a critical state. And that's basically how we verify that the, that the, uh, the events that are coming through are actually relatively current. Uh, and then we hook that all up with PageDuty there. So uh, who here has used PageDuty at all before? Quick show of hands. OK, so um, if uh, you haven't heard of it, PageDuty is a software as a service. Uh, I guess it's like an es escalation um, and roster management for on-call teams. Uh, and it also does pretty great alerting as well. Um, so the great thing about that here is you can use it as like a, a, as, a, as the end part to the out-of-band testing that's so it's completely removed from the rest of your monitoring infrastructure. Uh, other killer feature-wise, uh, roll-up. So there is alert summarization. Um, and there's a lot of effort that we put into this to make this work well. Um, so we actually have per contact per media thresholds. And what that means is the contacts are basically the core of every uh, core of the system, so contact being a human. Uh, and then uh, every contact has media that's associated to them. Um, so something like an SMS, email, Java, page duty. Uh, and then each of those media has actually got a notification threshold. And, and what Flatjack does with that threshold is it says, okay, let's say I've got more than five things that need to be uh, that I need to alert this particular person on this particular media for, say. Five, five checks for, uh, that I'm going to alert via SMS, then actually bunch them all up and send a single alert to say, hey, these five things are broken, you should go here to actually work out what's wrong. Uh, and we've got a lot of flexibility on that, so say for SMS, uh, SMS networks in Australia are not particularly reliable when it comes to delivering SMSs, um, so you might want to set that quite low. So if you've got more than, say, three, three things that need to be sent to somebody at one time, you send out a single alert, um, email, you probably don't want to wake up in the morning uh, with you know, a couple thousand uh, uh, monitoring alerts in your inbox, so you can, you can tune that uh, as you wish. Uh, and then you've got the likes of PageDuty as well, which actually has rollout built into the service, and you can actually just disable 
uh, that roll up in Flatjack entirely, and you can delegate the responsibility to another service if it's already got that. So that's uh, and that, that's on a per contact basis as well. So every user, uh, every consumer of the monitoring alerts is able to tune it uh, based on what works for them, which is pretty neat. Uh, and the way that this basically works is that every contact has, very, uh, has many media, and every media has one summary threshold. That's it. And we expose all this information over the API as well, so it's very easy to query it, change it, that sort of thing. Uh, tagging as well, so we use tagging as a way to do uh, sort of like in the Nagios terminology with host groups and service groups. Um, we put tags absolutely everywhere, so you put tags on, uh, on sort of the core flatjack data types. Um, some of them are more useful than others. Uh, we basically just added tagging wherever we, wherever we could uh, and hoped that it would be useful to someone someday and so on. It's a pretty useful feature though. Okay, so how does Flatjack actually work? And this is really important to understanding how you would manage uh, something like this with Puppet as well. So to really understand how Flatjack works, you probably want to have a very quick look at the data model and fortunately it's very, very simple. Um, so as I said before, contacts are at the center of Flatjack. We care about humans, we care about shielding the humans. Uh, and contact has many media, um, so media being SMS, email, uh, Java, PagerDuty. Uh, and a contact also has multiple notification rules. And notification rules actually handle how alerts are routed to people. Uh, and a contact can have as many notification rules as they want um, for you know, whatever weird edge cases they're trying to do within their monitoring system. Uh, contacts are associated with entities, uh, so an entity being uh, you know, an entity can actually be anything from uh, like an actual physical device, like a laptop or a server, um, all the way up to uh, an entire data center or a continent, if you wanted to. Uh, and then you've basically got probes against those entities called checks. Um, and you've, uh, your monitoring system is, sorry, the check execution engine is sending a stream of events um, about uh, checks that are related to particular entities. So that's it. That's pretty much the data model right there. We also maintain a little bit, a little bit of history off of the side. So whenever somebody sets maintenance or does acknowledgements or any sort of state change that happens on that service that we observe, uh, we record it for analysis later on. All right. So now that we understand uh, the data model, we can dive a little bit more into the architecture about you know, how all the different components of Flightdrive work. Uh, so as we sort of we've seen this a little bit before, but we've got event producers, uh, you've got your processes, and you've got your gateways. So an event producer can be, let's say, a Singa, Sensu, Nagios. Um, we've got different integration points uh, for each of those different check execution engines. So for a Singa and Nagios, we've got a thing called Flatjack Feeder, which is a Nagios event broker module that you load into Nagios, uh, and it basically takes the, uh, the observed state changes and the check results within Nagios, and it turns them into events that Flatjack can understand. Uh, Sensu as well, um, there's a bunch of great guys uh, over in Poland funnily enough, where Bubble Labs is from. Um, over at Jive Software, so Justin at Jive uh, has created a little plugin for Sensu as well. Um, Sensu is sort of like a, a more modern take on uh, check execution. Um, it's a bit more dynamic. It's sort of designed for the cloud. Um, and there's a lot of active work being done on it. Um, so you can use Justin's thing there to take the events out of Sensu and actually send them to Flapjack. Uh, and yeah, we've got a bunch of different event producers here. Um, so hypothetically, you could also hook it into Cron. You know, Nagios is at the end there. I won't say anything more. Uh, and then on the processor side of things, um, the processor is actually two different components. So you've got your plain old processor, which is uh, receiving the events, and then you've got the notifier. And the notifier has a bunch of uh, complex alert routing knowledge uh, and business rules in there. Uh, and what the processor is doing is it's taking the, uh, taking the check results, uh, so the events, and it's storing them in Redis. And it's asking those questions that we were talking about before about, you know, uh, is there something wrong? Do I need to notify somebody? Who do I notify? Uh, and the, basically the, the responsibility for working out who to notify and how to notify them gets delegated to this notifier. Presently enough name. Um, so there's some interesting alert routing logic that happens here to make all of this, all this cool stuff work. Uh, so you've got an event all the way up here. Uh, an event has got a bunch of filters that are associated with it, so it's basically finding a bunch of failed events. Uh, and then if it detects that there's a failed event, it turns the event into a notification. Uh, and the notification logic then kicks in. Uh, so there's a bunch of maps and reducers here. So it finds the people that are interested in that entity. Um, so let's say Alice, Bob, and Carol. Uh, and then on those people, it finds all the media. So Alice has got an email, an SMS, Bob's got an email and SMS, and Carol has also got an SMS. 
Uh, and then it deletes media based on tag, severity, time of day. So that's where the notification rules actually kick in. So in this particular case, we've just stripped out uh, Bob's email. Um, and then it can also delete media based on black holes. Black holes is a whole talk in itself. We can talk about that later. Uh, and then it'll also delete the media based on the notification intervals down here. So when it's deleting based on notification intervals, it's basically saying, uh, and this is done on a per contact basis as well, the contact says that I don't want to receive SMSs more than every five minutes or every 15 minutes. So if an if a event has come through and it knows that, it, and Flapjack knows that it needs to notify somebody about that, the person who says, oh, actually, I don't really want to receive notifications more than every 5, 5, 5 10, 15 minutes, um, it'll delete it at that point. And then all the way out the back here, you've got a bunch of alerts that are shot through, um, and that's it. That's pretty much how all the alert routing logic works. Uh, and then finally, we've got a bunch of gateways, uh, and we've sort of uh, we use the gateway architecture um, re really thoroughly all throughout Flatjack. So we've got, as I said before, gateways for emails, SMS, Java, and PageView. Um, but also, maybe a little bit surprisingly, we've got gateways for the web and the API as well. So the web interface for looking at how Flatjack works. Uh, it's just another type of gateway. It's a bi-directional gateway where you can read data out of it but also push data into it. Um, and the same with the API. And, and the, the cool thing actually about taking, uh, using this particular gateway design is that if we want to do new versions of the API, it's just a case of duplicating the old one. Uh, and the, the two can actually run side by side. So you know, it's a very easy way for us to be able to support multiple versions of the API or even different versions of the web interface, in fact. Um, so yeah, that's basically how gateways work. Um, there are some things about Flatjack that may surprise you um, compared to other monitoring systems. So firstly, Flatjack assumes that you have a constant heartbeat of events that are coming through. Let that sit in, sink in for a second there. So there is no concept of a one-off event at all. So Flatjack is assuming that your event producers are constantly checking, constantly feeding events through. It's fundamental to the way that things like the out-of-band end-to-end tester works. Um, but it's also really important because it's how our notification logic actually works as well. Flatjack fundamentally cares about how long the check has been failing for. It does not care about how many times the check has failed, which is quite different from the Nigeos model, right? So why do we do this? Well, we don't have any sort of concept of hard and soft states. If you've ever used Nigeos before, you'll know that uh, you'll have you know, multiple soft states where you don't notify somebody, and then it, after a thing has failed for enough times, so it'll kick into a hard state, and then it starts notifying somebody. Um, that can be a bit problematic, actually, when you have an irregular stream of events that are coming through. So you could, say, have uh, th uh, three soft states, uh, and then you know, all within five minutes of one another, and then there's some sort of problem on that system. Uh, and then you don't, uh, you know, and it's another 15, 20 minutes until an alert comes through. But at that point, the machine has already failed and it's already been down for 15 or 20 minutes and you don't know about it. Um, so that's the whole point here of having this, uh, you know, of, of, of caring about how long something has been failing for. Uh, and it's also fundamental to, uh, to the way that we send out notifications as well. So you can think of the way that we send out notifications as, as a, a sort of a broadcast delay. Um, so there's about a 30 second window that we actually buffer up events before we decide to actually send something out. Um, and that allows us to do smart things like alert summarization and roll up because we can actually look at all the events that are about to, all the notifications and events that are about to go out uh, to a contact and we can go, oh, okay, actually this, this, this particular person um, wants these notifications to be rolled up into a single alert. And we can do that very, very, uh, very, very easily. And again, this is all about shielding the human. Um, you know, we don't want them to be soaked at the end of the day. Okay, so let's get into the nitty gritty stuff uh, about how we actually integrate it with Puppet, fun stuff. So what we're going to do here uh, in this talk, this is actually going to be a bit of a live demo, um, we're going to configure Flatjack with Puppet itself. And what we're doing here is we're going to treat Puppet as an external source of truth for Flatjack. Um, so we're going to say that Puppet is uh, mostly authoritative for the data that's within Flatjack. Uh, and we're going to do this by managing a couple of the core data types in Puppet, uh, sorry, in Flatjack with Puppet. So we're going to manage contacts, media, notification rules, and the association between contacts and entities. And how are we going to do this? Well, we actually have a bunch of Puppet types um, to manage the data within Flatjack. And it's one of the great things about having uh, an API-first approach to, to building all the functionality within Flatjack. It means that we have a relatively strong and robust API um, that we're able to integrate with uh, pretty easily. So I actually only wrote these Puppet types a couple of days ago, um, and it just works. Uh, and the way that this is actually going to work is we've got Puppet over here as a single source of truth. 
Uh, and then Puppet is going to talk to the Flatjack API via these Puppet types and providers. The API is going to push the data into Redis. And then for monitoring alerts that are coming through here, uh, they're going to go through the Flatjack. Flatjack is going to check the data that's in Redis that we pushed in there via Puppet. And then it's going to send out some notifications. Type of fighter. So bootstrapping. Um, you can actually follow along with this at home um, this evening after I push off code. Uh, so the way that it works is we've got a Vagrant Flatjack box here. Um, so you can do a git clone of that and actually get Flatjack up and running on your laptop within you know, a matter of minutes. Uh, and we're going to do that and it's, yep, yeah, it's going to be booted. So from in here, we're going to start digging around in manifest site.pp. Can you all see that up the back okay? Okay, great. Um, so the useful bits here, um, uh, we've got a default node, so any Vagrant instance that we fire up here is going to have this particular configuration applied to it. Uh, we're saying that we're going to have uh, curl installed and we're actually going to run up a copy of Flapjack uh, with Asinga and Nargios both on, on the same machine. So we've actually got two different monitoring check execution engines and they're both feeding events into Flapjack. Uh, then what we're going to do is we're going to set up a Flapjack contact uh, for Ada Lovelace, um, who's based in London. You can see the email address there. Okay, so that's the data. There's nothing else to it. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to run Vagrant Provision. So when I run Vagrant Provision, uh, it's actually going to do a puppet apply on the machine. It's basically SSHing into the machine and then doing a puppet apply. Um, it does some other stuff beforehand as well, like trying to talk to RubyGems, which... Uh, in Australia, on our blazingly fast internet connections here, that can sometimes be a bit slow. As we can see, <laughs> I have a way to get around this. Give it a second. Fun times. Right, kill that. Uh, I'm going to turn that off. All right, let's try that again. Woo! Thanks, Ruby Gems. You're awesome. Okay, that's it. So we created a Flapjack contact here for ada.example.com. And if we go poking around, oh, hello. demo for later. <laughs> There's a point to that. I'm not just really vain. <laughs> All right, so you can see here that we've got a contact created for Ada Lovelace. Um, excuse the crappy, crappy resolution there. Um, okay, so we can see that the data is in there. That's all pushed in there from Puppet, which is pretty neat. All right, so now we're going to take it to the next level. What we're going to do is we're going to go here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an SMS media to Ada. Uh, so the way that that works, I uncomment that, uh, and I'm then going to run Bacon Provision again, which is doing another Puppet run. Okay, so you can see there that it's created an SMS media from, uh, it's turned a, a no SMS media into uh, one with a roll-up threshold of five, a particular phone number and a notification interval of two minutes. Um, and just ignore for a second that Ada is based in London, that she has an Australian phone number. We can, we'll get to that later. So uh, now that we've done that and we refresh, we can see here that Ada has got a mobile number. Awesome. All completely driven by Puppet over the API. Um, so Ada has now been added into the system. She's also uh, potentially receiving monitoring alerts, which is pretty neat. Um, and it's all completely controlled out of Puppet. So what we're going to do again is we're actually going to add a default notification rule here, of uh, basically a catch-all. So what we're doing here is we're saying that Ada at example.com, she wants to receive all warnings by email and all criticals via SMS. And you can do a combination of the two as well. Um, so let's remove that. Okay, another uh, puppet run. Okay, that's it. Uh, so if we dig down a little bit on Ada, um, excuse the other contact interface, you can see here that there is an Ada catch-all notification rule that's been created. Uh, for email and SMS. There's no time restrictions associated to that. 
Um, so we've got a pretty uh, pretty flexible way of restricting these notification rules to times of day, um, having recurring events, that sort of thing. Uh, but you can see here that we've created these catch-all rules. Um, so that's all working. Again, all powered by Puppet, which is pretty neat. Uh, and let's say hypothetically that um, Ada is an application developer, uh, and she wants to receive uh, all... Uh, all alerts for aco1.example.com. Um, she wants uh, warnings and criticals to both be SMSs to her. So let's do that. Oops. Another uh, vague provision. Magical. Okay, and ignore that that is being created over time. That is a bug. Okay, there we go. So warnings and SMSs, all there, all controlled by Puppet. Uh, and we can do a similar sort of thing as well. So let's say, uh, you know, she's an application developer, but she doesn't really care about receiving critical alerts for the databases, but she does care about warnings because, you know, she wants to have at least a bit of insight into what the database admins are having to do every day. Uh, so we're going to do the same old trick. And then... Magical, all there. Uh, and the tax display isn't working, but trust me, that does. It is actually working behind the scenes. Okay, so we've got that there. Uh, so we've got configuration for contacts, media, notification rules, all being completely driven out of Puppet, but talking to Flapjack. Uh, then the next bit is. Let me skip over that. Hira, um, which is probably the coolest part of this talk. Um, so, who here has used Hira at all in Angular? Okay, so maybe third of the room. All right, so this is going to be a nice practical example for the other two thirds of the room. Um, so, the way that we are integrating Hira here, if we pop up to the top, uh, is we're using this Hira resources function. And what this is going to do is it's going to look at all the Hira data in the hierarchy and it's going to find all resources um, that can apply to this default node over here. Well, it's actually very specifically going to apply to flatjack.example.org. Um, and it's going to instantiate those resources uh, on this particular node here. So I'm going to uncomment that. Um, and what I'm going to do here is I need a volunteer, um, somebody that's willing to have their mobile phone number up here on the screen. Anybody, quick show of hands. Woo, there we go. What is your name, good sir? Eric. Eric? Let's just keep your surname as Doe. <laughs> All right, and your mobile number is? 31 261 842. Okay, so you've got a notification interval here of 120 seconds and a roll up threshold of five. Uh, and what I need to do at this point, actually, is get back on the internet. Because uh, I won't be able to send too many SMSs without being online. Alright. Okay. So we've added uh, Eric's data in here. We can change John to Eric. Uh, and this is all configured here in Hira. Um, and what we're going to do now is we're going to do another puppet run uh, and go vagrant provision. And the cool thing about this is it's actually going to merge the data from two different sources. It's actually going to use the data that we've already got here in site.pp, and it's going to load this extra data from in Hira um, to say that we actually want to notify Eric about something. Okay, so that's applied here. Um, you can see here that Eric Doe.example has, uh, has been set up as a contact. Uh, Alright, so then the next thing that we're going to do here is we're going to simulate a failed check. So one of the little cool things that we've got uh, that we ship with Flapjack is a little script called simulate fail check. Uh, if you actually look at it, uh, it's a bit smaller so you can sort of see. Um, there are two different ways that you can simulate a fail check. You can fail and recover or you can just plain old fail. Uh, a bunch of different options here, so for how long we're going to generate failure events. Uh, how often we're sending those events through the entity and the check that we're sending those, alert, uh, those, those particular events for. Uh, okay, so Eric is all hooked up. Uh, and what we're going to do here is we're going to fail and recover for one minute, uh, an interval of 10 seconds for localhost.example. Ah, oh, actually, I just missed one thing. Let me stop doing that. 
Uh, Eric, where art thou? Eric Doe. And we need to associate you to localhost.example. Ooh. Ooh, and that didn't work. That's interesting. This demo is not going to go very well at all. Hey, there it is. Perfect. Okay, so we're going to do that uh, simulator the fail check. I see that Jesse is sweating a little bit down here. <laughs> okay, so we're going to send a failure event, critical. So there is a, uh, as I was saying before, there's this broadcast delay in here. Um, so Flatrack is basically buffering events for 30 seconds. So it's going to see 30 seconds worth of failed events before it actually needs to start sending an alert to someone. Um, so Eric, you should probably start receiving an alert in the next now. Schedule maintenance is not. It should be fine. No, I just use an existing check. Eric, do you have an SMS? <laughs> the phone reception in here is a little bit shit, sorry. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. So we, we are getting a critical alert here. When we were doing this with the testing before, there was up to like a two minute delay for the SMSs. So you have to trust me, it does work. <laughs> All right, so there's a recovery event. Anything, Eric? <laughs> well, shit. <laughs> Jesse, can I borrow your phone? Cool. Oh, locked. I'm just going to show you the actual words. Alright, there we go. Alright. You are going to have to trust me, but. There we go. Maybe if it focuses. Oh. <laughs> well. Yeah, this demo is going great, isn't it? <laughs> well, if you can read backwards, you can trust me that there are actually alerts that are being sent out here. Anything yet, Eric? <sighs> well, not to worry. I'm sure Eric will receive it as soon as I finish giving the tool. Yes, but you should, uh, you've probably received two alerts. You'll receive the original problem, um, and then you'll receive the recovery as well. Just yell out, actually. Um, if you do receive the alert. All right, uh, and to cap off, um, Flatjack is entirely open source, so you can download, start using it, integrating it in your own environment right now. Uh, you can find it on GitHub here at Flipjack Flatjack. Uh, we also have a very strong focus on quality documentation, so uh, we try and document absolutely everything we're doing here in the Flatjack wiki. Uh, we consider bad documentation to be a bug. We also consider a bad first experience to be a bug. I guess, Eric, you're probably having a bad first experience now, so we'll have to get that sorted. Go create a bug. Thank you very much. All right, uh, are there any questions? Because I've still got a little bit of time to go. Yes? Let's say you've got a follow-up. Hello, hello. Hello. hello, sorry. Come in. Got it. Yeah. All right, so what happens if you have an entire sort of network meltdown and you've just got hundreds and hundreds of alerts being sent out? Uh, yes. How can you handle that type of condition with it? Uh, so exactly with the thresholding. So the summary threshold, you basically say that for this particular person, uh, don't send them more than five alerts at once. Um, if you trigger that threshold, then you start sending out a single alert at the normal interval. Yeah, so we don't uh, we don't really use the concept of parenting or anything like that that you have in Nardios, um, mainly because maintaining a graph of data like that manually of all the different relationships between things becomes an absolute nightmare once you get to a certain scale. I mean, if you look at the size of bulletproof infrastructure, we're dealing with uh, thousands of services, uh, sorry, thousands, well, tens of thousands, possibly even hundreds of thousands of checks on thousands of services with thousands of people that could be notified at any point in time. Um, so. Trying to maintain a graph for that, you would have to like employ a team of ten people, and their work would never be done. It'd be a very depressing job. Cool. 
More questions? Yes, up there. So, this guy. <laughs> um, in your implementation of the um, the subject bubble module, um, how are you how are you interacting with the API? Are you doing things like upserts just to, so you don't have to like check? And... Yeah. So um, if we want, we can have a little bit of a look at the type and provider. Um, this is going to be deeply embarrassing for me because this is the first type and provider that I've ever written for Bubble. Maybe we should prepare that. Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Um, so yeah, I've actually, so I've been using Puppet for seven years now. I did one of the largest Puppet deployments in the very early days um, in Australia. Uh, and up until three days ago, I've never written a Puppet type and provider. So um, who actually, quick show of hands, who here has written a Puppet type and provider before? Okay, so please, those of you that raise your hands, do not laugh. Um, but it should be fine. So if we look at the... Uh, Flapjack contact type. Oh, I've already got it open. Yes, all right. Let me kill this. Can you all see that up the back okay? Might be a little bit small. But. All right, so this is just a plain old puppet type here. We've got a bunch of documentation. Uh, we've got a bunch of properties that we're setting uh, for the SMS media because it's a hash. We need to do a little bit of extra legwork. Um, so we've got the two states, what the state currently is and what the state should be. We're manipulating the output uh, from the API and also what the user is putting in to sanitize it, to make sure that it's all, uh, it's all strings. We've got a nice sort of convenience function there for, uh, for printing it out. Um, so this is the type side of things. This is the very, very lightweight implementation of like what you're actually dealing with within the Puppet DSL. Uh, but then you've also got the provider. Um, and this is where the interesting stuff actually starts happening. So um, we use a, uh, a little library. Uh, we actually ship a library as part of the Flatjack project called Flatjack Diner. It allows you to consume Flatjack. Uh, and we do some slightly insane things in this puppet module um, to embed Flatjack Diner in here. Um, but you've got a bunch of standard methods. So you've got a create method for, uh, funnily enough, creating the contact. Uh, and then associating any media. So this is an interesting use case actually in that um, generally when you're writing a puppet type of provider, you're only ever interacting on one single thing at a time. Whereas because we, uh, we have a fairly granular API in Flatjack, you've got, a, you know, you've got an API endpoint for uh, creating a contact plus another API, API endpoint for setting media, notification rules, that sort of thing. Um, you probably want to, like when, when we were designing the types, we were thinking about what's the, what's the simplest way to actually get up and running. So uh, for me, um, my opinion there was that, well, you probably don't want to have a separate type just for SMS media and another one just for email media. Those media actually relate directly to one of these contacts. So from a user perspective, um, you want the media to be in line with the definition of the contact. But of course, that makes the implementation of the provider a little bit more complex. Because not only have you got to create the contact with one API call, then you potentially have to create, you know, two, three, four other media with separate other with other separate API calls. Um, so, uh, so we, we we sort of got a it's a little bit complicated here, but we basically create media that's associated with contact. Um, so that's doing the creation. There's also the destruction. Uh, exists, first name, first name. So you can see here that we're actually using uh, the Flatjack Diner API. So there's a, there's a file above all of this that we've required that knows about where uh, Flatjack is actually located. Uh, and we're just calling a method on uh, this sort of uh, Flatjack object called update contacts. Um, and it'll you know, set the first name, last name, whatever. Um, it gets a little bit more complex down here. Like uh, who here has written a bit of Ruby before and understands what's going on here? Okay, so a few people. Um, so here, in this particular case, we're actually using some of the metaprogramming stuff within Ruby that allows you to dynamically define methods. And the reason that I did that in this particular approach, it might seem a little bit scary, but um, the uh, accessor methods for setting SMS and email are exactly the same. So rather than you know, having a huge chunk of code here duplicated um, for the SMS, the email for pager duty, um, I basically defined uh, a nice little thing up here. So, so let's say I want to add an accessor for pager duty. I'm going to do uh, pager duty and Java. Now, suddenly I've got exactly the same convenience methods available to it. I don't need to write any more code. I just added those two little, two little bits in there. 
Um, and that behind the scenes is using this create media accessor method um, that the Flatjack Diner provides, um, the same for updating, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so that's basically how all that works. And then uh, we've got a bunch of private methods here for like common helper things for accessing the data and that sort of thing. So it's all pretty simple and straightforward. Um, yeah, it's fun writing types. So you can actually fetch the data and check the differences? Yes, so, th so the question was, do I fetch the data and check the differences? Absolutely. I do a little bit of caching, but yeah. Um, quick question. I was just wondering for your um, SMS gateway provider. Ah, uh, yeah. That works out of the box. I presume you have to do that yourself. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we're using we're using MessageNet, um, and that's pretty much because that's what Bulletproof uses. Uh, but as I was saying before, we make it very very easy to write new gateways. Um, so it's pretty easy to, to talk to whatever other SMS gateways you want. Um, we sort of have a post 1.0 development goal uh, to get different uh, SMS gateways uh, supported, uh, just so that it makes it easier for people to plug it in. Just one last question at the back here. Apart from notifications, can you actually get Flapjack to actually do something more useful rather than just notifying people like, let's say, restart a service? Yes, you would totally write a gateway to do that. Um, right now, Flapjack is optimized for one thing. It's about protecting the human, being the shit umbrella for all the alerts that are going to come through. Um, but that said, you could absolutely write a gateway that had like an auto remediation engine um, that would go, okay, for this particular type of thing, I've seen this before, go and treat these particular tasks, you know, hook it up to end collective, right? You know, I've seen these particular types of, uh, these types of monitoring alerts that are coming through. Um, Run a you know run an M collective client to go and you know restart a bunch of services across my cluster or you know free up the disk space or something like that. You could you could absolutely do something like that very very easily. Wonderful. I think that's all we have time for. Thank you very much, Lindsay.